The sudden storm rolling in felt like fate. Perhaps it was a curse in the spot in the ocean, or perhaps it was just the luck of the draw. But all that the towing crew knew was that the lead had snapped, and the once beautiful Great Lakes freighter was now a wild bronco, bucking in the heavy seas. She heaved and she hawed, but unfortunately her already cracking hull couldn't hold up, and she broke back, facing a fate at the bottom of the ocean beside the most infamous shipwreck in the world. Welcome to Shipwreck Sunday. My name is Eleanor. Just a quick disclaimer for our younger audience before we dive in. This story may be disturbing to some, so viewer discretion is advised. Okay, everyone, let's get into it. I'm very excited to continue our Great Lakes extravaganza this week. Thank you all so much for the love on the Great Lakes content. We'll have to mix it up and continue doing more variety here on the channel. Today we are covering the sister ship of the ill-fated SS Daniel J. Morell, SS Edward Y. Townsend. There isn't a ton of information available on her, but I will share what I was able to find out about her. Alright everyone, let's go. SS Edward Y. Townsend was a Great Lakes cargo freighter built for her first operator, Cambria Steamship Company of Cleveland, Ohio, which was the recently formed maritime subsidiary of the Cambria Iron Company. She was built by the Superior Shipbuilding Company of Superior, Wisconsin as yard number 515, being built in 1906 and launched on August 18, 1906. She would be completed and enter service by September of 1906, being completed as the longest Great Lakes freighter until her sister of the same size, the Morel, would be completed shortly after her. Though the two ships were built by different shipbuilders, they are still considered sisters because they are damn near identical. Because she was the longest ship at the time of her launch, she'd briefly hold the title of Queen of the Lakes, an unofficial title given to the longest ship servicing the Great Lakes. We have colored other queens of the lake, including the infamous SS Edmund Fitzgerald, if you are interested. SS Edward Y. Townsend would be operated by the M.A. Hanna Company, which was one of the most experienced vessel management firms on the lakes. They'd cease management of the Townsend and the Morrell as of 1927, and in 1930, the Bethlehem Transportation Corporation, a subsidiary for the Bethlehem Iron Company, took over management for the two sisters. Bethlehem Iron Company was based out of Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, and would later become the now-defunct Bethlehem Steel. Her U.S. registry number was 203449, and her port of registry was Wilmington, Delaware. Now that we have the basic rundown of the vessel, let's get into her specs. SS Edward Y. Townsend was a bulk cargo freighter carrying bulk cargoes like iron ore, coal, grain, and sometimes limestone. And she had the classic cargo freighter look, being long and skinny with a straight deck design. For her tonnage, she displaced 7,438 gross registered tons and 5,673 net registered tons. And these are in imperial tons since we are talking about an American-made vessel. In imperial measurements, she was 603 feet long, had a beam of 58 feet wide, and a height of 32 feet tall. In metric measurements, that is 184 meters in length, a beam of 18 meters wide, and a height of 9.8 meters tall. She was powered by two Scotch Marine boilers feeding a single triple expansion steam engine attached to one fixed pitched propeller, her engine being built by Detroit Shipbuilding Company. This setup could produce 1,800 horsepower or 1,300 kilowatts of power, pushing the ship along at 10 knots, which is 19 kilometers per hour and 12 miles per hour. She wasn't a speed demon, but she was reliable. She too averaged a crew of about 29 men, much like her sister ship. Her paint scheme was also very average for the day. Dark maroon red for her keel and hull with a white superstructure in the fore and aft sections of the vessel. Just like her sister ship, she was built prior to 1948, and thus the steel used in her construction contained a higher level of sulfur than we see now. This made her hull incredibly brittle and weak in colder waters, much like the cold lake waters during November storms, and this would doom her and her sister later on. Her long, skinny construction was also not great for the sea, and suited for the geometry of the Great Lakes much better, so keep this in mind for her sinking later. As for her service history, she was incredibly reliable hauling cargo across the lakes, save for a couple notable incidents. On Monday, April 26, 1909, 
She would collide with the steamship Philip Minch off Whitefish Point on Lake Superior, and she sustained minor damage. It's unclear what kind of damage the Philip Minch sustained. Later, SS Edward Y. Townsend would run aground near Buffalo, New York on February 1, 1926, due to low water levels. She'd remain there until February 6, finally being freed and needing repairs. In 1944, SS Edward Y. Townsend would receive a refit, with her Scotch Marine boilers being replaced by Babcock and Wilcox boilers that upped her power output to about 3,200 horsepower or 2,350 kilowatts. She'd also receive a new engine in 1954, receiving a triple-cylinder Skinner Uniflow engine, and this made her marginally faster. Just like her sister, she'd suffer from uncomfortable vibrations at higher RPMs, and her displacement would increase by about 500 tons. After this, her next incident would be the night her little sister, SS Daniel J. Morrell, would sink. If you want to hear her story in full, check out our recent episode on the Morrell. If you're enjoying this video, leave me a like, subscribe to the channel for more content, and let me know down in the comments section below. Okay, back to the story. In 1966, SS Daniel J. Morrell and SS Edward Y. Townsend were both doing well and proving profitable for the season. SS Edward Y. Townsend, like her sister, passed her inspections at the beginning and the middle of the season, with nothing of note being mentioned during these checks. The season I'm referring to is the time that Great Lakes freighters run their freight, which is after the thaw of the Great Lakes in the spring and ending before the lakes freeze over. Typically during the winter, the ships spend time in dry dock for repairs and maintenance. The crews of the Morrell and the Townsend assumed they were done for the winter in November of 1966. However, they would face one last job together. The ship slated to transport a load of iron ore from Taconite Harbor, Minnesota to Buffalo, New York for Bethlehem Steel suffered mechanical issues and was no longer able to carry out this task. So the Townsend and her little sister would take up the final job of the season, being incentivized by bonuses for the captain and crew. SS Daniel J. Morrell, the younger of the two sisters, departed Buffalo on November 26, 1966 at 11 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, with SS Edward Y. Townsend following suit four hours later on November 27, 1966 at 3 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Both of the ships were empty when they left to head to Taconite Harbor, and they were supposed to return to Buffalo together after receiving their intended cargo. However, both sisters would prove to be unlucky during the impending storm. Both sisters would face a nasty November storm. November storms on the Great Lakes are notorious for heavy rain or snowfall, biting winds and heavy seas, and this proves deadly for many ships. They form due to the different pressure and temperature systems that collide over the Great Lakes, creating large storm systems. If you want to hear about the deadliest November storm in the history of the Great Lakes, check out last week's episode on the Great Lakes storm of 1913. SS Edward Y. Townsend would follow a bit behind the Morrell due to leaving four hours later, but she'd follow a similar route, crossing over an incredibly stormy Lake Erie and stopping to refuel in Windsor before continuing up the Detroit River. She'd radio in that morning for her daily position report to Bethlehem Steel on November 28, 1966, before facing the storm ahead. That morning on Lake Huron, the lake was choppy with 70 mile per hour or 113 kilometer per hour winds and waves up to 35 feet, which is 10.67 meters tall. The sisters, miles apart from one another, headed out into the storm. Later that day, SS Edward Y. Townsend would turn back to the St. Clair River to take shelter, while SS Daniel J. Morrell would continue out as planned. Unfortunately for the Morrell, she would break back, snapping in half and sinking, killing all but one of her crew. But we aren't quite there yet. Another Great Lakes freighter that snapped in half was SS Carl D. Bradley, and we do have an episode on her if you are interested. SS Edward Y. Townsend would resume her journey at some point, sustaining a major crack in her hull on the northern Lake Huron and limping into harbor in Sault Ste. Marie, Michigan, late in the day on November 29, 1966, a mere 12 hours after the foundering of her little sister. Upon her arrival, immediately everyone knew something was wrong. The Morrell had not taken shelter and had left port first, so she should have already been there. After this, the rescue for the Morrell commenced. While this daring rescue mission was going on, SS Edward Y. Townsend was inspected in Sault Ste. Marie. While she was here, she was deemed unseaworthy due to the enormous crack in her hull. The United States Coast Guard canceled her certificate and she was laid up. She would sit for two years as her owners decided what to do. 
The ship was aging at 60 years old when the crack in her hull happened, and 62 in 1986 when her fate was sealed. So the company had to decide whether or not it was worth pouring that much time, money, and that many resources into an aging vessel. Ultimately, they decided it was not worth it, and she would be sold. SS Edward Y. Townsend was sold to Sea Land Service Incorporated for sale in the U.S. Maritime Commission in 1968. As part of the reserve fleet, there was two main possibilities. Another company could buy her and refit her, or a scrapping company could buy her for scrap. She was purchased by Marine Salvage in Santander, Spain, and she would be loaded up to cross the northern Atlantic past Newfoundland. By September 15, 1968, SS Edward Y. Townsend, being towed by the tugs James Battle and Salvage Monarch, in tandem with the steamer Dolomite being towed by the Dutch tug Hudson, would pass by Port Colburn, Ontario, Canada. Dolomite was also destined for the scrapyard, and thus the tugs and their tows would follow one another to Spain. This episode couldn't be possible without our lovely patrons. Thank you all so much. If you'd like to support the channel and future episodes, go to patreon.com slash shipwrecksunday to join. The going was slow, but was steady and seemed to be all going according to plan as they headed out into the open Atlantic. Storms on the Atlantic can be just as ugly, if not worse, than those on the Great Lakes. And SS Edward Y. Townsend was not only suffering from a massive crack in the hull, but entirely out of her element when she'd run into a northern Atlantic storm with heavy seas in early October. On October 7, 1968, SS Edward Y. Townsend was passing near where RMS Titanic sank, roughly 400 miles or 644 kilometers southeast of St. John's, Newfoundland, when she broke loose from her tow lines in the heavy seas, bucking in the heavy seas like a wild bronco. Eventually, all the stress on her broken hull became just too much, and she cracked clean in half just like her sister, and she would sink, joining RMS Titanic at the bottom of the Atlantic. Though this sounds like this area of the Northern Atlantic is possibly cursed, and while I would love to believe that, RMS Titanic and SS Edward Y. Townsend sank in a very busy shipping lane, so it isn't surprising that there are numerous shipwrecks in the area, including but not limited to the William Brown and possibly two other shipwrecks that are undiscovered. According to historical record, the fishing vessel Andrea Gale foundered in the area as well as the White Star liner SS Neuronic, which disappeared in the area and was rumored to have sunk to an iceberg here as well. We do have an episode on SS Neuronic if you aren't interested in that mystery. The rest of the tow arrived safely at Santander, Spain on October 20th, 1968 without SS Edward Y. Townsend, leaving her to a watery grave. Her exact coordinates are still unknown, since she is in very deep water, but we do know she is in the vicinity of RMS Titanic and is one of her closest neighbors. RMS Titanic lies at a depth of about 12,500 feet or 3.8 kilometers below the surface of the ocean, which means the town's end is in similar conditions. Luckily, no one died in the sinking of SS Edward Y. Townsend, and her peculiar sinking place raises her notoriety, though not nearly to the level of her sister ship. Hopefully, we will one day discover where the shipwreck of this legendary Great Lakes freighter lies, and we can uncover even more of the ocean floor of the Northern Atlantic. And that is the story of SS Edward Y. Townsend. If you liked that story and wanted to hear something else on the Great Lakes, check out our episode on the Rouse Simmons, the Christmas tree ship that sank during a nasty November storm with a load of Christmas trees aboard. Thank you for tuning in to Shipwreck Sunday. Stay tuned next week for the story of the Bermuda Triangle, where we dig through the conspiracies and find the truth. Have a great week, and we'll see you next time. Thank you.